Hello everyone and welcome back to Neuropsychology. So we covered everything in the sensory system or all the big key players like the visual system and the auditory system and somatization and now we are going to dive into the motor systems. So in this video we will talk about um, an introductory example of motor systems we're going to talk about the motor, premotor, and supplementary motor cortex and where that is located. And we are going to talk about four uh, regions for skilled movement in the neocortex and then about the motor homunculus. If you guys remember, we talked about the homunculus, um, about somatosensation. We also have one for the motor system. Okay, so all the parts of our nervous system, they work together to move our body. So it's not just one simple system. So therefore, our motor system is really important. Otherwise, we can't stand up straight and we also can't move or dance or play sports. So let's take a look at this image. This is an image from the book. In this image, you see the stepwise sequences that your nervous system performs in directing your hand to pick up a cup of coffee. So there's a lot of steps that have to happen um, just for something simple as picking up a cup. So first, the visual system inspects the mug to determine what part of it to grasp. So you want to make sure that you grasp onto the handlebar, right? So then the visual cortex will relay this information to the motor cortex areas and they will plan and initiate movement. So when they do that, they will send instructions to the part of the spinal cord that controls your arm and hand muscles. So you can move your arm towards there and you can grasp with your fingers around the handle. So as you grasp the mug's handle, information from the sensory receptors in your fingers will travel to the spinal cord and from there messages are sent to the sensory areas of the cortex to interpret or touch. So the sensory cortex um, technically informs the motor cortex that the mug now is being held. Now if the cup is way too hot, the sensory system will send signals to the motor cortex to let go. So that's often when you drop a cup is because your sensory system is like, whoa, no, this is way too hot. And your motor system reacts by just opening up your fingers and you let go of the cup. So during this movement and all these things that are working together, a lot of systems are active and that's not even just it. So other central nervous system regions have also been modulating and adjusting this movement but they kind of work behind the scenes. So you can see those in picture B right here. Um, so the subcortical basal ganglia, we talked about that in the beginning of this class. And the subcortical, uh, subcortical basal ganglia, they help produce the appropriate amount of force for grasping the handle. So not too much, so you don't break the handle, and not too little that you don't drop it. And then the cerebellum helps regulate the movement timing and accuracy. So make sure the movement goes smooth. So as you can see, so many brain areas are involved in a very simple movement as grasping a cup of coffee. So in the next couple of videos, we will talk about how the brain and spinal cord work together to produce movement. And then we're going to talk about how the neocortex, brainstem, and the basal ganglia and cerebellum contribute to this. Okay, so here's a little recap of the picture that we just saw. So this is just an example of what happens when you grasp the coffee cup. I know I went through it very quickly, so I put them here um, in numbers so you can um, kind of remember how they work together. So let's start off with a visual system. So the first thing your eyes do is they look at the cup and they locate the target. So then after you locate the target, you know where you should reach. Then information from the prefrontal cortex, from our frontal lobe, they will um, plan and command the movement. So in the prefrontal cortex or in your frontal cortex, that's where the motor cortex is. Then the information goes to the spinal cord, so it goes all the way down the brain. And the spinal cord will carry the information to your limb, or to your arm in this case. 
So motor neurons will make muscles um, in your hand and in your arm move. So it, it will reach toward the cup and your fingers will kind of close together um, to grasp the cup. So the sensory receptors in your hand will feel the coffee cup and it will send information back through the spinal cord in the sensory areas of the spinal cord. Then the basal ganglia will judge um, the grasp of force and the brainstem can correct it if needed, so it gives feedback. And also the cerebellum works with this, so the cerebellum makes sure that this movement is going very smoothly. So the sensory cortex receives the message that the cup has been grasped. And those are all the steps, all the very schematic steps, a little bit more is going on, but these are very schematic steps of how our systems work together for a simple movement like that. Okay, so before diving uh, deeper into how the brain is responsible for movement, I wanted to go over the location of the primary motor cortex. So we talked about the sensory cortex and we talked about um, the retina, so our visual cortex. Um, so the primary motor cortex, which we also call M1, M for motor and 1 for primary. And then we have the supplementary motor cortex, or we call this also SMA. And then we have our premotor cortex. So the primary motor cortex is located right before the central sulcus. So here you have the central sulcus. And the mo uh, primary motor cortex is located right before that. So it's in the precentral gyrus. And then the um, supplementary motor cortex and the uh, premotor cort cortex are right in front of that. So the SMA is a little bit more dorsal and the PMA is a little bit more ventral and it goes all the way to the lateral sulcus. So apart from these, so these are the main motor cortices. Apart from that, the posterior parietal cortex is also really important. We're going to talk about that a little bit later. But here you see the location of it. It's posteriorly in your parietal lobe. Okay, so we just went over the location of the motor cortices. However, they do not work alone. So there are four neocortical regions that produce our skilled movements. So we have the posterior cortex, the prefrontal cortex, premotor cortex, and primary motor cortex. So we went over where the premotor cortex is, and we went over where the primary motor cortex is, and also the little orange blob in the previous slide showed you where the posterior sensory cortex is. The prefrontal cortex um, is a little bit before all the motor cortices. Okay, so the posterior cortex lies posterior to the central sulcus, and this area speci uh, specifies movement goals and sends sensory information from vision, touch, and hearing to the frontal regions via multiple routes. So the more direct routes will tell the primary motor cortex to execute relatively automatic and small, simple movements. Information about movements requiring more conscious control or more planning they will take indirect routes through the temporal and frontal cortex. So I'll show you guys a picture of this in the uh, next slide. The prefrontal cortex receives instructions from the posterior cortex, and then it technically creates a plan for movement, and then it will pass it along to the premotor motor cortex. So then the premotor cortex, which is right before or anterior of the M1, it will recognize these um, movement instructions, and it will also recognize movement of other people. And then it will select similar or different actions to take. And then that information will be sent to the primary motor cortex, and this will eventually produce specific movements. So here you see how it goes. So if a movement is complex and needs planning, it goes from the posterior sensory cortex to the prefrontal cortex, then to the premotor cortex, and then to the motor cortex. Okay, so these are just blocks, and it's way easier to see how that works in the brain. So here's a picture from the book. And when a movement goal arises in the posterior cortex, which is right here, 
there are two routes for action, as I just talked about. So if it's a simple um, action, for example, if you put your hand towards your mouth, then it will send um, information directly to the premotor motor cortex. However, if this movement needs some form of planning, um, it will send information through the temporal, oh, through the temporal right here, and uh, uh, prefrontal cortices. And these will then make decisions and will send it to the premotor cortex, so right here in purple. And then after that, it will go to the primary motor cortex right here in blue. And then the primary motor cortex will eventually um, take action. So they are the final input and then it goes to the spinal cord and to your muscles. So this is a very schematic pathway of the motor system for movements requiring conscious control. Okay, so Wilder Penfield was a researcher and neuroscientist in the 1950s. So around that time, he was studying the motor cortex. So what he did is he used brief pulses of electrical stimulation to map the cortices of conscious human patients who were about to go, um, who were about to undergo neurosurgery. So he and his colleagues they found that the most of the movements were induced by their experiments um, that were triggered by stimulating the precentral gyrus, so what we now know as the primary motor cortex. So this is why they called that the primary motor cortex, because these were most active in all these motor functions. So they also found that movement can be produced by stimulating the dorsal part of the premotor cortex, and therefore this was called the supplementary motor cortex. So he summarized his results in drawing a cartoon, which was a representation of the body parts. So this cartoon represented the areas in the M1. It's right here on this picture. So it's a little cartoon on the primary motor cortex. And this is where stimulation caused those parts to move. So it was called, it was also called the homunculus, which means little human, just like it was in a somatosensory system. So the motor homunculus is upside down relative to the actual body. So the feet are more dorsal and the head, as you can see right here, this is a head and a mouth. They are more um, ventral, close to the lateral sulcus, which will be right here. So the key of the homunculus is that it is very disproportionate in size. So the motor homunculus is very, has very large hands and especially as a very large thumb. It also has a large uh, tongue and large lips. So these distortions of size, they reflect the fact that large part of the motor cortex regulate our hand, finger, lip, and tongue movements, giving us more precise movement there. So body parts that we have less precise control or movement control over are represented as smaller in this homunculus. Okay, so this was the end of the video, and in the next video, we will dive a little bit deeper into the motor systems.